This week's video is part one of a two-part comparison of the King James Version Bible, or KJV, also known as the Authorized Version, with the English Standard Version, or ESV, first published in 2001. But I'll be quoting the most recent ESV text from 2016. In this video, we'll have some background on the two translations. And we'll follow that with a look at a few Old Testament passages where the translations differ because the ESV relies on the Dead Sea Scrolls, or the Septuagint. Part 2, which will appear in a separate video, will concentrate on the New Testament. The KJV is an authorized revision of the Bishop's Bible. King James I authorized its production for the Church of England at the Hampton Court Conference in 1604. The King James Version Old Testament is based on the Masoretic Hebrew, but the essay at the front, the translators to the readers, does not state which edition. Internet sources report that the KJV translators used the Second Rabbinic Bible of Jacob ben Hayim, published by Daniel Bomberg in 1524, as the base text but the influence of the Septuagint and Vulgate is detectable. The KJV's New Testament is based on the so-called Textus Receptus. The term Textus Receptus is used equivocally. Sometimes it means the text received from the Eastern Roman Empire, and sometimes it means a series of printed editions of the Greek New Testament, beginning with Erasmus's 1516 edition. In this video, I use the term in the latter sense. While the KJV New Testament is based on the Textus Receptus, it doesn't agree in all points with any edition of the Textus Receptus, even with Scrivener's 1894 edition, which was created with that goal in mind. Scrivener used Theodore Beza's 1598 edition as his base text. The ESV is a revision of the 1971 edition of the Revised Standard Version, it is the work of evangelical scholars. The ESV's Old Testament is based on recent editions of the Masoretic text, but it makes use of the Dead Sea Scrolls and ancient versions where needed. Like the KJV, the ESV's New Testament is based on a printed edition of the Greek New Testament, but a more modern one generated on different principles. The Greek text that appears in both the Nestle Elan 28th edition and the, the United Bible Society's 5th edition, or NA28 and UBS 5. The KGV, KJV was originally printed with the Apocrypha, included in a separate section between the Testaments. The original ESV excluded the Apocryphal books. To my knowledge, only one edition of the ESV with Apocrypha has appeared, and that edition is currently out of print. I sometimes hear complaints that our translations are being updated too frequently these days. Some find those updates are unsettling. I've heard people say that they prefer to stick with the KJV because it, at least, isn't going to be updated. I want to point out that both the KJV and the ESV were born in times when new translations were frequently being published and older ones were being updated. It's true that, today, that today's pace is faster than that in 1611, but you might want to read the history of English Bible translations in the late 1530s, with the Coverdale Bible, Matthew's Bible, and the Great Bible all published within a period of about five years. They were coming quickly in those days. Thomas Cranmer, who was Archbishop of Canterbury and later was burned at the stake under Queen Mary, wrote concerning Matthew's Bible, quote, And as for the translation, so far I have read thereof, I like it better than any other translation heretofore made, yet not doubting but that there may and will be found some fault therein. As you know, no man ever did or can do so well, but it may be from time to time amended." Unquote. That's from a letter he wrote to Thomas Cromwell on the 5th of August, 1537. Nor were the King James translators opposed to revisions. In response to the complaints of the Catholics, they wrote, 
for to whom ever was it imputed for a fault by such as were wise to go over that which he had done and to amend it where he saw cause and now we live in a time when some protestants have grown weary of new bible translations the kjv is sometimes criticized for its archaic language but I think you'll agree with me that it is generally quite easy to understand. I can read chapter after chapter and only occasionally be forced to consult the dictionary to look up the meaning of an archaic word. It does use some out-of-date verb endings and some curious pronouns, uh, but it really is simple to comprehend most of the time. The ESV is in standard modern English. Some criticize it for using awkward syntax, and I admit that it isn't in the casual English of everyday American speech, but I'm happy about that. My complaint is that it doesn't retain some of the dignity and beauty of expression of the Revised Standard Version. One other significant difference is that the KJV uses italic font for words supplied by the translators, but which don't map to words in the original language. That use of italics started with the Geneva Bible. Just as an aside, I sometimes hear it said that modern translations are in error at 2 Samuel 21.19 because they state that Elhanan killed Goliath. But to those who know what the italic font means, the KJV says the same thing. Here's a family tree chart that shows some of the translations descended from the KJV. The KJV is the great-great-grandparent of the ESV, based on the way I've shown the generations here. Both are in the Tyndall tradition. Some say that the ESV is not in the Tyndall tradition because its New Testament is not based on the Textus Receptus. But to me, based on the style of its English prose, the connection of the ESV to Tyndall seems clear. I've only shown the New Revised Standard Version and the ESV as children of the RSV, but there have also been two Catholic editions of the RSV. KJV is generally more beautiful, engaging, inspiring, and memorable than the ESV. I offer this statement without proof, but I sus suspect that most of you who have spent time with both will agree with me. And if you haven't, I encourage you to read first one and the other in a few passages, such as the ones I list here. So now we'll move on to side-by-side -side comparisons of the KJV and ESV in a few Old Testament passages where they differ due to differing base texts. In other words, these are cases where the KJV and ESV translate different source material. We'll start with Deuteronomy 32.8. Here the Masoretic text, which the KJV translates, reads, Sons of Israel, but the ESV has Sons of God. Where did that come from? The ESV is following a scroll found in Cave 4 at Qumran, scroll J of Deuteronomy. The reading from the Septuagint is similar. It has angels of God. There is a very informative footnote in the NET Bible regarding this verse. The note states that Sons of God, the Dead Sea Scroll reading, is without doubt original, and the Masoretic text and the Septuagint have interpreted it differently. The Masoretic text takes it as a reference to Israel, while the Septuagint understands it of a heavenly assembly. Apparently a similar phrase in Ugaritic is used to refer to the god El's heavenly assembly. That was a relatively simple difference. Look now, later in the same chapter, to verse 43. There are a number of changes here, but we'll focus on the ones in red to save time. The phrases, bow down to him all gods, and he repays those who hate him. The reading, bow down to him all gods, comes from a different scroll found in the fourth cave at Qumran, the Q scroll this time. 
It's interesting to see how similar the Dead Sea Scroll reading is to the Septuagint, which has, and let all the angels of God worship him, here. The author of the book of Hebrews quotes the Septuagint's reading in Hebrews 1.6. The words, he repays those who hate him, are from the same scroll. Again, they back, they back up the Septuagint. I don't know what logic led the ESV translators to follow the Dead Sea Scroll in this verse, but the ESV Study Bible has a note here that reads, The Hebrew Masoretic text, which the ESV usually follows, presents problems in this text. So here the Dead Sea Scrolls and Septuagint variants have been followed, as they represent an earlier stage of textual transmission." Unquote. I understand the reluctance that some might have to concurring with the ESV translator's textual decision without more data, but I have difficulty understanding why Christians should feel obligated to follow the Hebrew or the Masoretic text, particularly since the New Testament authors, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, quoted the Septuagint so often. In Deuteronomy 33.8, we find a minor difference. The ESV includes the words, give to Levi, and a footnote attributes those words to a Dead Sea Scroll and the Septuagint. The Revised Standard Version included give to Levi here, but it did so based on the reading from the Septuagint. The New Revised Standard Version also includes give to Levi, and the New Revised Standard Version attributes the words to the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint. But it isn't clear what Dead Sea Scroll contains these words. Whether the change makes any material difference in the meaning of the passage, I leave that to the viewer to decide. In the 144th Psalm, the ESV presents a reading that's included in a Dead Sea Scroll and a minority of other Hebrew manuscripts. As a result, rather than saying that God subdues my people, like the KJV, the ESV says that God subdues peoples. That's a rather significant difference. The Dead Sea Scroll responsible is from the 11th cave at Qumran. A note in the ESV Study Bible explains, though the reading my peoples has more textual support, the many parallels with Psalm 18 CF 1847, support the reading of the ESV text, that is, peoples. We find a more radical difference in Isaiah 14.4, where the KJV has the golden city, the ESV has the insolent fury. The ESV says that the meaning of the word in the Masoretic Hebrew is uncertain, and the KJV footnote and this footnote is found in my Nelson 1611 reprint, reflects uncertainty. The NET Bible states that the word in the Masoretic is, quote, unattested elsewhere and of uncertain meaning, unquote. The ESV reads, the insolent fury based on the great Isaiah scroll found in Qumran cave number one. The NET Bible reads hostility. The Septuagint's Taskmaster, taskmaster, and the Dewey Reims tribute carry connotations of oppression, so they seem closer to insolent fury than to Golden City. Here in Isaiah 21.8, we see a striking difference between the KJV and the ESV. The KJV would have someone cry out, a lion or following the footnote, which is present in Nelson's 1611 KJV reprint, someone cries out like a lion. The ESV, following a Dead Sea Scrolls reading, has, He who saw cried out. The ESV reading is based on the great Isaiah scroll, and it seems to make more sense here. Apparently, the Syriac supports the Dead Sea Scroll reading also. In Isaiah 49:24, we're faced with a choice between lawful captive and captives of a tyrant. The KJV footnote, which is an original KJV footnote, gives the alternative 
Translation, Captivity of the Just The ESV's Captives of a Tyrant is here again based on the Great Isaiah Scroll. The ESV footnote also cites the Syriac. And I show you Lamza's translation here, not in any way meaning to promote Lamza's particular views. But I can't read Syriac, and Lamza says the Syriac here equates to captives of a giant. The ESV also cites the Vulgate and the Douay Rings, which is based on an edition of the Vulgate, has that which was taken by the mighty, which is similar to captives of a tyrant. The NET Bible says that the Masoretic reading here, captives of a righteous one, makes no sense in the parallelism. In Isaiah 51.19, on the one hand, God's comfort is contemplated as coming through a mediator. By whom shall I comfort thee? That's the KJV's reading. The ESV instead expresses doubt about any comfort at all. Who will comfort you? The ESV's rendering is based on the Great Isaiah Scroll, and it's backed up by versional evidence. I show here English translations of the Septuagint, the Syriac, and the Latin. I must say, I like the way the ESV has punctuated this verse. It shows more clearly what the two things are. The KJV makes them look like four things. With 1 Samuel 2.33, we transition from translations influenced primarily by the Dead Sea Scrolls to those based on the Septuagint, at least as far as the ESV's footnotes are concerned. But in fact, both the shift from the second person pronoun thine to the third person pronoun his in 1 Samuel 2.33 are supported by a Dead Sea Scroll reading. The Dead Sea Scroll is 4Q Samuel A. It isn't clear why the ESV footnote makes no reference to it, but the ESV's footnote is accurate as regard the Septuagint, as Brenton's translation shows. I don't find any errors in the ESV's footnote on 1 Samuel 9.25. The ESV translators decided to follow the Septuagint here, but it isn't clear why. Samuel's discussion with Saul atop the roof doesn't appear to present any difficulties. It may be that the ESV simply left the Revised Standard Version rendering untouched. The RSV was prone to follow readings not found in the Masoretic Hebrew, and as we mentioned earlier, the ESV is just a revision of the RSV. Another immediate descendant of the RSV, the New Revised Standard Version, or NRSV, also follows the Septuagint here. Here's a lengthy example from 1 Samuel 10.1. The ESV follows the Septuagint in supplying additional material for Samuel's speech given at Saul's anointing. If you look carefully at the ESV text, you'll see that the words anointed you to be prince appear twice, both just before the material in blue and at the end of it. It seems probable that a scribe skipped over the intervening material because of this repetition. The editors of the NET Bible think so. Here in 1 Samuel 14.41, we find a relatively lengthy insertion from the Latin and Greek translations into the ESV. This insertion would seem to go against the ESV's stated intent of keeping with the Masoretic text whenever possible, since there doesn't seem to be anything inherently difficult about the shorter version as represented by the King James Version. As I mentioned earlier, the ESV's parent, the RSV, had a propensity to depart from the Masoretic text, and it did so here in 1 Samuel 14.41. It may be that the ESV translators will revert to the Masoretic reading in a future update. I show here the same verse in the Dewey Reims Bible, which is based on an edition of the Latin Vulgate. As you can see, Jerome or one of his revisers. I say that because I'm not sure how close the Dewey Reims is to the original Vulgate here, 
Jerome or one of his revisers translated Urum and Thuman with Latin words that equate to proof and holiness. The New English translation of the Septuagint uses clear ones and holiness, respectively. 1 Samuel 17.12 is an example of a passage that's easier to understand in the ESV than in the KJV. The words, The man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul, aren't altogether clear, at least not to me. The textual difference is highlighted in blue. The Masoretic Hebrew has advanced among men, but the ESV has opted for the Septuagint's, well, Codex Alexandrinus is to be specific, the Septuagint's reading of advanced in years. In 1 Samuel 20.41, the ESV follows the Septuagint in replacing out of a place toward the south with from beside the stone heap. Here again, it's not clear why the ESV translators found the Masoretic reading too difficult to translate. The 1977 New American Standard Bible has David arose from the south side. On the other hand, the NET Bible's note at this point reads in part, it's hard to see what meaning the Masoretic text reading from beside the south would have as it stands, since such a location lacks specificity. Psalm 145.13 is longer in the ESV than in the KJV because the ESV includes material from the Septuagint. Psalm 145 is an acrostic with each verse beginning with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But the verse for the letter Nun, N-U-N, is missing in the Masoretic text. The NET Bible observes that, quote, scholars are divided as to the originality of this verse, unquote, meaning the material in blue and square brackets. It's possible that the verse for the letter N-U-N was deliberately omitted by the author and that later scribes felt compelled to invent this verse to round things off. The Revised Standard Version included the material shown here in blue with slightly different wording, but it did not cast doubt on their authenticity by enclosing them in square brackets. In Jeremiah 3.1, we find the ESV following the Septuagint and Syriac and in omitting the word saying at the beginning of the verse. The KJV interprets this word as they say, which implies a dialogue between the unidentified they and the Lord. I'm not sure there's any great implication either way, nor is it clear to me why the ESV chose to move away from the Masoretic text here, but it's possible that this is just another example of the ESV letting the Revised Standard Version's reading stand. Finally, here in the beginning of the account of the flood in Genesis 6 is an example of where the King James Version appears to follow the Septuagint, while the ESV leaves a Hebrew word untranslated. The Hebrew word is Nephilim. The Septuagint translates the word as giants, and it is true that the Nephilim, described in Numbers 13.33, were large, since they made the Israelite spies feel like grasshoppers by comparison. But the meaning of the term is not certain, which explains why the ESV leaves it untranslated. So, although the preface to the ESV states that it attempts, quote, wherever possible, to translate difficult Hebrew passages as they stand in the Masoretic text, rather than resorting to emendations or to finding an alternate reading in the ancient versions, unquote. They appear to have done so more frequently than that rule requires. Not that I mind. In my opinion, the Septuagint, which was the Bible received by the early church for about four centuries until the time of Jerome, and often endorsed by the New Testament authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, hasn't gotten the respect it deserves particularly so now that alignments between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint 
show how the Septuagint preserves ancient readings. We'll end part one here. Part two will focus on the New Testament. It will begin by assessing the KJV and the ESV in terms of literalness. Thank you for your time, and remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already done so.